So I'm pulling this one out of the archives for you guys. This is a Scanner Danner Premium lesson I uh, did with my class 10 years ago. Yep, 10 years ago, 2007 Nissan with a duty cycle controlled um, O2 heater circuit with a fault. In this lesson, we go through circuit testing, we go through voltage drop testing, we go through current flow measurements, we talk about duty cycle, pulse width, and frequency, the differences between them. Uh, we also substitute a test light for the load. We talk about computer driver shutdown. Um, if you want an idea of the types of lessons that I provide for my students at Rosedale Technical College, and on Scanner Danner Premium, this is a great lesson on foundational uh, electrical circuit troubleshooting. It's a ground side switched, pulse width modulated or duty cycle controlled heater circuit. And uh, really, it just applies to everything, not just oxygen sensor heaters. This would be every single ground side switch circuit on a car that's computer controlled. This is the lesson for you. Doesn't matter how old the class was 10 years ago, still relevant today. All right, so we have two codes, our closed loop fuel control or closed loop control function fault and our O2 uh, S1, that's our upstream low voltage for the heater circuit. So research said these are both related, and we said this is a wideband sensor, and we knew that based on, I want to cover this with you again, based on this voltage reading we have, and that would be this guy right here, this air fuel sense one, bank one, that's my upstream, this HO2 S2 bank one, that's my downstream. They do not use wideband sensors for downstream catalyst monitoring. Uh, it's not necessary. We use the upstream one. If we want to know the ratio, not the exact window of stoichiometric, that's where the widebands come in, they're upstream. We never see widebands downstream. So narrow band O2 downstream is our bank one Sorry, bank S2, bank 1. It's just backwards, and that little hand's in the way there, isn't it? See, HO2, S2, B1. That's, you, that's backwards from what most of the ones we see. We usually say bank first, then sensor. That could throw you off if you're reading it fast. Our focus is on this upstream. It is a wide band. We're going to do the heater circuit first. Our wideband sensors, scope testing them is very difficult. The heater circuit, it's not. So what I want to do before we do the heater circuit test, we're going to do power ground uh, voltage on the, on the power and ground for the heater, and we're going to do current. What I want to share with you guys, which will help you tremendously, is in section four, where you guys are. So section four... Page six, what I have down here at the bottom is typical four wire heated O2 sensor wiring, sensor side. Now, why would I put this in here? This car is a perfect example of why, because I'll, I'll get you a shot of where the O2 connector is. I can't really see the harness side of the connector. And I mentioned this to you guys before, and this is really where it's going to come into play. If we check a wiring diagram, we want to know the heater circuit of the O2. We are going to be looking at colors, and the colors on the diagram are not going to match our car. What I'm seeing is um, a harness that comes up this way, so, and there's four wires on the connector, and the O2 sits in an area I really can't see it. I know it's there, and the connector is here, and what I see, this side would be harness side, okay? This is the harness side, and this would be the sensor side here. O2 is tucked back in here somewhere behind the exhaust. I can't see it. But what I saw on this car was two blacks, a black, a black, a blue, and a white. Okay? And the nice thing about that is I have those colors up here for you already. And the reason that this is an advantage right now is time. If I'm working in the field, I can check this heater circuit without going to a wiring diagram is what I'm telling you. 
And in general, when you look at oxygen sensors and you see two wires that are the same color, that's the heater circuit. Notice the, the one to the left of this, I have two whites, a gray, and a black. Well, the two whites are the heater circuit. Two blacks on this car is the heater circuit. I already know on this 2007 Nissan whatever, what model Nissan is this? I don't even know. It's a Sentra. I have never worked on a 2007 Nissan Sentra, and I already know the heater circuit on the O2 on this car. Is this an advantage? So I, we can pull the diagram too, but I think for, for this, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool info right there. I'm actually going to maybe a first check, an easy first test on this for the heater circuit would be to simply take an amp probe and clip over top of one of the two black wires, and it doesn't matter which one. Current flow is the same throughout the whole circuit, throughout the heater circuit, whether it be the, the feed or the ground. Take a look at what it looks like. Uh, a little bit further into this, because we have a heated O2 code and a heater circuit problem, if we, if we end this and go to section five real quick, and in section five, what I have is I have some heater circuit tests, and this would start on page nineteen. The cool part about this is some of the info in here relates to section three, which we just finished, which is power and ground side switching. Guess what? That's what we do to O2 heater circuits. We either control the power side of the O2 heater or we control the ground side of the O2 heater. And some of these are pulse width modulated. We mentioned that too. Uh, pulse width modulation here would control current flow. As with a solenoid, pulse width modulation controlled current flow so we could control magnetic field strength. With magnetic field strength being able to be controlled, we can move a solenoid pintle in whatever position we want to. That's why we would pulse them. On an O2 heater, it's not magnetic field. It's still current flow, but the reason we would pulse the heater would be to control the temperature. We don't maybe always need this thing fully on all the time. It would be pulsed so we can control it. Now, will that change what our signal is going to look like here? If it was on all the time, what we might see is something like this. This is a heater, this blue trace. Just look at the blue for now because that's what we're going to do. The car is off. The system is off right here. And when I started the car, we have a current rise, immediate rise. And uh, there's a little conversion here. I'm doing voltage conversion. This is actually amperage. 0.1 is 1 amp. 0.2 is 2 amps. So we're hitting about an amp and a half right here. And then as it stabilizes, you know, we're down here about one amp of current flow. This would be a non-pulse width modulated heater circuit. This would be something that's turned on as soon as you start the car, okay? As opposed to one that's pulse width modulated, we're going to see something like this. That the heater current, this green trace is the current flow on this. And you see the, the mirror image of the voltage trace, which is the heater power. Um, this is a pulse width modulated O2 heater circuit. So you see the two different ones that we're looking for. 07 Nissan. I don't need to go dig up information yet. I can just put an amp probe on this thing and roll with it. Let's see what we got. Okay. All right. So let's go to the car. You know what? Before we go to the car, as I'm thinking about this, sometimes on the scan tool, the scanner actually gives us data parameters for the heater circuit. It'll give you current draw on the scan tool. So remember I said use the scan tool as much as you can before you get out of the front seat of the car. I'm, maybe this is an example of that. So just scrolling through here, uh, you guys help me out here. Let me know if you see a, a heater, uh, O2 heater data pad. I didn't see one in there. But we have two other data lists, engine data two. There was heater, but that wasn't O2. It was like fan or something. Looking for O2 heater. See my a, uh, AF sense one right here. That's my voltage. That's the air fuel ratio sensor wideband. I don't see a heater. That 
that's the end of that one. And then one more. If this was a Ford, Ford gives us heater data pits, heater um, circuit current flow on the scan tool. Okay, so it just says off or on. And that would be our um, S2. That would be the downstream, agreed? HO2 S2 would be a downstream heater. Um, there's a percentage, check it out. So we know a little bit about this now without even going to the car. Now why would they give us an AF? So that says, it's hard for you guys to see that display, but that says AF S1 HTRB1 percentage. This is a pulse with modulated heater circuit. The fact that I'm getting a percentage data PID would tell me that. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a percent. Uh, is that like standard? Yes, that is standard. Let me come back to let me come back to the smart board here again. And we need to talk a little bit about this. We we said we were going to do it at the end of section three, and and we. Uh, never really finished it. This particular one, I guess the best thing for me to do for you guys to keep this as, as simple as I can would be let me draw my own picture first. And that would be if I were to do this and draw a on-off signal, okay, and then make this a... Make this a one second time base from here to here. What I have is a one hertz signal. So um, what I'm giving you first will be the frequency, right? Frequency is number of times per second the signal repeats itself. That's what frequency is. If you guys want to write that down, do it. Frequency is number of times per second a signal repeats itself, okay? I don't know if that's proper English or not, whatever. Number of times per second, a signal repeats itself. And so what we see in my uh, first capture up here is I see a rising edge, I see a falling edge, and then I see a rising edge again. So this rising edge is this rising edge. There is one cycle that has taken place in this one second time frame. This is a one hertz signal. There's some other characteristics in this signal that we can pick out. And it is duty cycle and pulse width. So let's define duty cycle. Duty cycle, which is going to be expressed as a percent. This should kind of maybe ring a bell right now with this O2 heater that's giving me a percent data PID. Okay. Duty cycle percentage, this would be a measurement of on time. A measurement... Is there an E on that? Or I drop the E. A measurement of, see, it doesn't have to be on time, but for the automotive field and what we generally do, it's the on time of the signal. It can actually be the off time too, but it is a measurement of on time within, this is the key here, within one cycle of a signal. And it's a percent. It's expressed in a percent. A measurement that is a percent measurement of on time within one cycle of a signal. Now, you could say the off time, too, because if you're measuring percentage of on time, aren't you also calculating the off time? Our total percent is 100%. In this cycle, your total percentage would be, would be 100%. And in this picture that I've given you, our on time... See, if you follow this, our on time can be low or our on time could be high depending on if the component is power or ground side switched. If it's power side switched, your on time is high. If it's ground side switched, your on time is low. And so it's not one or the other. It's variable. Okay. Uh, in our example, I'll call it ground side switched because most of our components are. 
So we'll say that this is my on time down here and this is my off time. A ground side switch component would react that way. High voltage with it off, low voltage with it on, ground side switched. This is a 50% duty cycle signal that I just drew up here. Okay? One more is our pulse width. And our pulse width is also a measurement of on time. Let's say this, with no comparison to the off time. Would you agree with me to get a percentage of on time, we have to compare that to the off time in that period? Percentage, we, we need it. Where pulse width is a measurement of on time with no comparison to the off time, and it's, uh, let's say this, it's expressed, I don't know, if, expressed as a time, not percentage measurement. And that time measurement is generally in the millisecond time measurement, milliseconds. If you think of injector pulse width, that's the amount of time the injector is on. We're not worried about percentage of the injector off time. We're just looking at the on time shots of the fuel injector. So you see duty cycle and pulse width are really close to each other, aren't they? What's my pulse width in my imaginary picture? Uh, I want a number. Pulse width. 0.5. Uh, yes. 500 milliseconds. Now, this is where 0.5 is good. That would be our uh, half a second. There is, if you wanted to do our millisecond ones, would you agree with me that 1,000 uh, milliseconds would be one second? If you don't, too bad, you need to. A thousand milliseconds is a second, okay? And you see my percentage, half of that, it's just easy math here, would be 500 milliseconds, or if you wanted to use a decimal, it would be 0. 0.5. This is 500. Our pulse width in this picture is 500 milliseconds, okay? So would you agree that if I change the pulse width, I would change the duty cycle? Or if I change the duty cycle, I would change the pulse width. Let's do it real quick just so we can see it, okay? Um, I will change. I'll keep the same frequency signal, but what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to draw it a little bit different. I will draw it like this, and we still have a 1 hertz signal, but what we have now is a difference in on time. Can you guys see it? Up here, if you look at my drawing, I intentionally picked half of this signal to make this easy math for you guys. My dotted line sucks here, but right. Um, what our duty cycle, see if you guys follow this, our duty cycle is now 75% on, which means our off time is 25%, and our pulse width would be 750 milliseconds now, and our, right? Did I do that right? Yeah. 250 milliseconds of off time, 750 milliseconds of on time. So again, if I change the duty cycle, I change the pulse width, right? Yep. All right, so do you understand in our field why these terms are interchanged? Some manufacturer will say this is a pulse width modulated device, and other manufacturer, the same manufacturer a year later, same device says this is a duty cycle controlled device, and you're like, what gives, right? They're the same, right? They're not. They're not. We can actually have a change in one but not the other when frequency changes. Now see if you follow this. There is, a, there is a difference, and this is a little bit beyond this car, but if I make this signal, see if I can do this. It's difficult to do. If I make this a 2 hertz signal now, you guys with me? This is now a leading edge, trailing edge, leading edge, that's one, trailing edge, leading edge, that's two. 
in a one second time frame, this is now a two hertz signal. Wait, what? Okay. My signal, I just changed the frequency on why you. Is it, why is it two though? Because you only have two squares? Um, no, there's two complete cycles, Nikki. Here's one, watch. Here's one leading edge, trailing edge, leading edge. That's one cycle. Leading, and, and so that one's the same, kind of the beginning of the next one. Leading edge, trailing edge, leading edge, that's two. There are two complete cycles taking place in this time frame now. And easy math here, really, it's 50% it's duty cycle still because your duty cycle percentage is a measurement of on time within one cycle of the signal. It's a 50% duty cycle, but it's only a 250 millisecond pulse width. Okay. If you do the math, you split these up. These are in quarters here, aren't they? So 250, 250, 250, 250 makes 1,000, doesn't it? I have 250 milliseconds of on time. So there is a difference. There is a difference between pulse width and duty cycle. And an example that I gave at the end of section three was using our injector duty cycle to find a dropout in the injector instead of looking at the pulse width. We don't really measure injector duty cycle, but I'm telling you that in that example at the end of section three, injector duty cycle was what really caught the glitch or dropout in the injectors. If you have an injector that's spraying, set, uh, let's say 10 milliseconds long, okay? Let's say this time frame is 10 milliseconds. And then there's a break between it because we got to go through the four strokes again. And then we have the injector firing again at 10 milliseconds and then firing again at 10 milliseconds. You guys follow? Yeah. If I were to look at that and plot that on a graph, what that would look like is, okay, I'm at 10. I'm at 10 again. I'm at 10 again. It would be a flat line graph. Picture the car. I'm at wide open throttle. All right? And... I just happened to miss this event. This one did not occur at all, but the next one did. So we get this next 10 millisecond shot. So this is 10, this is 10, this is 10, this is 10, but we have a gap of nothing. The injector never fired. Did the mid-max scales change, or did it just have a longer gap between 10s? When this scope plots this on the screen, it will look like that. You won't see it. It's a flat line. And what that said to me is my injectors never dropped out. They never changed. If you look at duty cycle, you'll see it. Because there's a longer gap of off time. The percentage changed. The duty cycle changed. The pulse width didn't. Is there a difference? Look at that case study at the end of Section three, and there's a video that I'm showing where a cam sensor malfunction on a Ford Taurus, this is what's, what's causing that problem. Injectors are dropping out, and it's the duty cycle that's very evident of that loss of injection pulse. A sudden change in injector pulse, if this injector fired, but only fired at one millisecond, would I see this? Of course, this line would drop and then come back up. That would be a glitch. We'll see a sudden pulse width change but a dropout where it doesn't fire at all, and you're looking at pulse width, you're not going to see it. So I think that's the lesson of duty cycle pulse width. Now, back onto this car. If you guys didn't follow that, please watch that video. End of section three, there's a hyperlink for a Ford Taurus with a cam sensor problem that I'm showing this exact thing, okay? This car, it's an O2 heater. I don't know what the frequency is. It does not matter to me, okay? What I know about this is it is a pulsed on off signal. And if it's ground side switch, we don't know yet. We'll do some checks to find this out. If I want to have a circuit, let's say it's ground side switch, it's a heater, okay? And I want to have full current flow on this. By the way, it's, it's definitely going to be transistor control, but it, it may be on the power side, not the ground side. I don't know yet. We'll just draw it like this for now. If I want full current flow, if I want full heat, what this driver will most likely do, and it depends on the design, but it may fully ground it. So if we were looking at the circuit on a scope, we would see 14 volts when we start the car, and then all of a sudden that drops down, kind of like what we were looking at before. 
and my waveform in section 5. That's a full ground. If it wants low heat, low current flow, the pulse width may look like this. Just draw a couple of cycles here for you so you can get a little perspective. If that would be an example of less current flow, less heat, where this one will be an example of more. What did we do? My on time ground side switched is this section here where it's low, agreed? So you see how long your off time is and see how short your on time is? So that might be a representation of like 10% duty cycle, where down here, the low portion we said is our on time, ground side switched. Do you see how long your on time is? And that might be a representation of 90% duty cycle. That's what we are going to see on this car. It's not that difficult, really, if you think about it. This is what a percentage means on our scan tool when we saw that on the scan tool. Now, if there's an open in the heater, what are we going to, when we connect our amp probe, what are we going to see? If there's an open in this heater, if I connect an amp probe here, or if I connect an amp probe here, doesn't matter, what are we going to see with an open in that heater? Is there going to be any current flow at all? No. It's going to be nothing, zero amps. So when we see that, we now need to do voltage checks. Now we're back on section three, which is cool. Is it ground side switch? Is it power side switch? What's my voltage level at the component? What's my voltage level at the computer? Is the computer turning this thing on or not? Do we have a wiring problem, computer problem, sensor problem? A little bit more perspective on why this says AF sensor one heater bank one percentage now. What are we going to be looking at? Are we going to be looking at the square wave or are we going to be looking at the command or what the computer wants the duty cycle to be at? You know the 10%, 90% I just gave you? That's all we're going to see here. We're going to be looking at the issued command, not the actual on-off signal. We'll know what the computer wants it to be at, right? Um, start this car real quick. Let's see what it does before we do our amperage measurement. We have an exhaust hose on this? Okay, good. Just watch the O2 or the air fuel sensor. 100% duty cycle. That would make sense right off the bat, don't you think? Why would we want 100% duty cycle? Sensor's cold. Why would we limit the current flow through the sensor when it's cold? We shouldn't be, right? Uh, let's watch that for a minute. Starting to drop. By the way, there is no such thing as 100% duty cycle. 100% duty cycle is just simply on. Your limits for duty cycle are technically like 95% and 5%. You, if you say 0% duty cycle, technically it's off. It's not being pulsed. So um, that was interesting, though, that we saw 100%. That was really what I expected to see. Just kind of watch that for a minute. I, I believe as this warms up, that number is going to drop. You know what I want to do now? Shut this off. Uh, turn the key back on. Hopefully it'll let you without losing this data. Turn the key back on. All right, I want to catch this now because that's going to get very hot back there. And let's get the amp probe reading on here. We can look at scan data and the amp probe at the same time. Okay, can you guys see this okay? Well, you see my hand, right? All right, this, this, is, the, this is the O2 uh, wire. Tough shot here because, you know, there's the firewall and here's the back of the engine. Um, uh, you know, I really eyeballed it by, see if I can get too much shadow. Right down here is the exhaust heat shield. You see that where I'm pointing? All right, and then I'm following the wire next to it. I really couldn't see the sensor, but it's the only sensor that's going to be attached to the exhaust. And then what I looked at when I pulled this uh, insulation back, what do we see? Two blacks, blue and a white. So we're working on an unfamiliar car, but do we know for sure that the two blacks are the ones we want to be focused on? So I'm just going to put an amp probe around either one of these two. Uh, I'm setting my amp probe on a 20. So that'd be this little switch right here, right? Set that to a 20. Zero the amp probe, which will get rid of any magnetic interference. And then you're ready to connect it. It is important that we only choose one wire. 
not both, because if you do both wires, what you have is current going in, current coming out, and your polarity will cancel each other out, and you'll have no amperage reading at all if you try to go over both wires. That makes sense? And then the other thing that's important, you see how the jaws are fully closed? You don't want that to be pinched in there in any way, shape, or form to get an accurate reading. It has to be closed all the way. And let's make sure I didn't bump my switch. Am I still on a 20? Yes. And uh, we want to make sure this amp probe doesn't get melted on the exhaust. So what I need to do is kind of rig this up here in a way that it's not going to fall down. That's pretty good right there. I'm just plugging my amp probe because I'm, I'm going to use the uh, scope part of the tool now. And I know it's yellow and what everybody likes to do is, is put that red amp probe lead into the red port. See it to the right? The red port is channel four. I don't want to use channel four. I want to use channel one. The amp probe is universal. It's not channel specific. So channel one and you can use channel four if you want, but what'll happen when you turn the scope on the default is channel one and you'll have no signal and you'll be like, dude, I don't have a signal. There's something wrong with your amp probe. And I'll be like, dude, you're on the wrong channel. So I still want to look at this and to look at this, this is hard to, to do. I, I'm, I'll explain to you what I'm doing at another point in time, but I want to look at both the well, we'll just bounce back and forth for now. I, I won't make this complicated. I'm going to go to the scope. And what I want to see is the waveform itself. So I'm going to go to my lab scope. I'm going to go to my low amp 20. Does that make sense? That's the tool I'm using. So it'll scale it for me. And we haven't done anything with amp probes yet. But what you need to understand about an amp probe is an amp probe makes a small voltage and then the scope interprets that as amperage. So that magnetic field that's generated by the wire with current flow traveling through it, it will generate a small voltage and that's what you're sending to your scope. So you select an amp scale because you're scaling that millivolt reading that's coming in. It's actually voltage. A um, couple things here. I want to turn off this channel. Don't need that one on. I'm going to turn my cursors off. Time frame, this is going to change. I'm going to start with a, with a 5 amp setting because I don't know the amperage on this one. And then time base, we'll start at one second. We can change that from there. And these are all things that we'll be talking about and how to do that. Uh, it's more experience, really. Or it's more getting the signal, see what it looks like, and then go from there. Okay? Um, can you start that for me again, Jared, please? Okay, I have no signal here at all. This is not good. So a few things. Either I am incorrect about the two black wires being the heater circuit. You saw I'm definitely connected. Or my switch turned off on my ammeter. Uh, or I'm on the wrong channel, and I'm not. I'm in the yellow one, so I'm all good there. Or the computer's not turning the O2 on, so now we can bounce back to the scan tool and just see if that command is there. And it's not. It's only showing us... 4%. I wonder why that changed. Temperature, right? Car hot soak, temperature of that. But there is a command there. It's only 4%. Can you shut that off for me again and then start it back up? I want to see what the initial startup is. Got to turn the key back on. Got a little bit higher there. There is a command there, though. 4%. The computer wants it to be on. I should have a signal here, and I don't. Should have, it would have been nice to catch that 100% command, but without me knowing the logic of the system, I can't tell you when it's going to issue 100% again. There's no current flow here. I think we are seeing the problem with this car. Um, before we put a O2 in this, we need to make sure voltage is good now on these two wires. And, and really, it would help to know circuit design before we would go any further and guess. That's where a wiring diagram comes in. This will be good practice for section three. Turn that off for me. Turn the key back on. Okay, good. You guys follow me? We should have had current flow here. 
Was there a, an issued command from the computer system? Yes. Uh, it was only 4% there, but should I have some type of pulsing taking place here? Yeah. Yes, it could be because of the wires. It could be a wiring harness problem. It, it could also be a computer problem, too. Even though the command is there, what you need to understand about scan data, scan data is not an actual thing. Scan data is the command, right? And you see that 100% up there, too, momentarily. We should have seen that on the scope. We were looking at that live. I, I didn't turn anything off. Home tab. Scope. See, that scope's still alive. We had nothing there at all. That is a live screen. You see this bar moving across the bottom. It's moving slowly, but it's moving, isn't it? It's on a one-second screen. We saw no activity at all. Guys, the command was there. Does not mean the computer's good either. Just saying that that's the program that you're looking at. Does that make sense? Another example, if you're looking at injector pulse width on the scan tool, that doesn't mean that injector's firing. It just means the computer is commanding it to be X milliseconds. Same way here. I'm not saying this is a bad computer. I don't want to mislead you. This is probably 99.9% .9 and open in the O2 heater. But I'm just sharing some insight with these systems for you. Okay? No current flow. No current flow means we have an open. Command's there. We have an open somewhere. Okay, so we want a wiring diagram for this O2 circuit where we're going to find that would be wiring diagrams all, system wiring diagrams, and then it's going to be engine performance. There's only one engine listed for this car. It's five pages. I'm not going to print it for what we're doing right now. I just want to see the O2 circuits. And there's my air fuel ratio sensor, one. That's the one we're working on. Notice the wire colors, right? Would that throw you off or what? You're like, dude, that's the wrong diagram, right? No, it's not. Two blacks, a, a blue and a white, that's sensor side. I promise you on the harness side, it has these colors. Okay, so some more clues for you guys as we go here. Our shielded circuit, do you see the dotted line right here and then the shield? That is, sorry, this dotted line is a shield. What they shield is signals, low voltage signal circuits. They never shield a heater circuit. They shield the signal circuit. So clue for me right away, this wire and this wire are the heater circuit. Cool? Even though there's nothing designated there, I promise you that wire and that wire is the heater circuit. So we, we scroll down. Let's, let's take a look at this one, see where it goes. Comes over this way. goes to the computer, says AFH. That's air fuel heater. That's our computer wire. Okay? And that didn't tell us anything, but what we do is we follow the wire. See if this makes sense. We follow the wire that does not go to the computer will tell us what our circuit design is. So this goes to 23 on the next page. Not pin, but 23 uh, designated 23 line, yes. And so we find that on this page, 23 right here, and we follow that further. It goes to 16. You guys with me? Did you guys know you could highlight on these? Did you know if you hold the Alt button in, the little hand comes up on the keyboard and it makes it real easy to move to? What was that, 16? So 16 going further to 9. And we zoom on 9. And 9 comes up to a splice. Don't worry about that splice. What is that? So is this O2 heater power or ground side controlled? It's ground side controlled. Externally powered, internally grounded. We were correct in our assumption that this was ground side switched. This is a ground side switch circuit. That's pretty cool that we have this. The last one was really cool too. This one's really cool in the fact that, that this is what we just covered, and we're covering a new subject, and you see how we're starting to, to tie them now. And we, you know, that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, this is a ground side switch circuit. So now we need to have a good understanding of what that means to us, ground side, power side switching. And, and here's the thing, guys, right? Now this isn't about an exam. This isn't about a test. This is about fixing this car and making the right call, okay? A ground side switch circuit, 
what you guys need to have the perspective of, and I know it's not a coil, we'll draw it as a heater now. Here's the circuit. The voltage level here, this initial voltage level right here. So I'm going to connect a voltmeter, my scope here, and I'll actually do it in two locations. I'll probably check both. Um, this voltage level here is my main focus. I can't say that. It's really both. We could plug in so many different scenarios here. How about I do two voltage readings on the two black wires, and then we figure out where we go from there. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And where we would be going, uh, do, I don't want to do all the hypotheticals, I don't think now. I don't want to write them down and see if you guys remember. If I have no power at all on either wire, which direction would you go? If neither wire shows me anything, if I have zero here and zero here, I guess I'm lying to you that I guess I'm doing this. <laughs> Fuse. I might just have a bad fuse here, you know? These air fuel ratio sensors are not cheap. They're probably two to $300. Two to $300 replacement of a sensor just because of a blown fuse. Now, if that fuse is blown, could the heater circuit have blown the fuse? Yeah. So once you change the fuse, then doing another current measurement would be imperative. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that would be one. What if we have uh, 12 here and... Well, we have a couple things that we know already. An amp probe either here, okay, or here. I'm not sure which one I was on. doesn't matter. What I do know is I have zero amps. So it's not a short to ground. We know that already. It can't be a short to ground. A short to ground on the control wire, which would be over here, would cause constant current flow. Is this starting to ring a bell? So uh, it's not that. I'm either dealing with an open in this circuit somewhere or I'm dealing with an open driver, or I'm dealing with an open fuse. Two very fast voltage measurements is what's necessary here. Uh, last piece here before I do the measurement. You guys probably need a break, but I'm not giving you one. Um, this, this splice right here and where that goes uh, will actually answer that fuse for me. So that's eight. Uh, not that I don't, it's easy to check the fuse, but this is just some logical thinking here. Doesn't that fuse also feed this line, this other red black wire? It's feeding that too. Let's see where that goes. It's feeding my other O2. Um, we would have a code for the downstream sensor as well. If it was the fuse. If it was the fuse. Sometimes these fuses might feed an ignition coil, too, where you'd say, hey, this car is not going to be running if that fuse is blown. Not that we can't easily check the fuse, but I'm telling you now that this fuse is not going to be blown. So that is my connection. I'm just back probing one of the two black wires, and I'm using an extension here, a jumper wire, because my lead is not long enough for the Varus, and that's completely acceptable. My... This would be my scope positive lead and my scope negative leads connect to the battery negative. Take a look at the scope screen. What do we see? See 12 volts. Oh. Flat line 12. Flat line. Here, let me okay. change the scale to give you a digital number here too at the same time. So we have 11.8 volts on that, okay. on that yellow line. So that's our power feed. We knew we were going to find that. It's what we expected to see because we, the other O2 shares the fuse and we didn't expect to see no power to this thing at all. We expected to see... 12 volts on one of the two, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move the T-pin now to the next one. Um, I'm not showing this one on the camera. I'm just moving the T-pin over. Back probing this. Preferably, I normally like to back probe the mm. harness side. The reason I like to back probe the harness side is we could have a harness side connection there. I always like to go harness side when I can, but I can't get to the harness side on this. This is our other black this is wire. Another black wire that doesn't show any. Like, no, nope. it's nothing. It's nothing. No voltage at all. So is that normal? No. Okay, so they should both. Let me. Is that the one you had to let's answer? let's. Okay. Let's talk. Actually, at this point now, uh, no, don't go back to your seats yet. Now, you you guys don't know a lot about O2 heaters yet, but I'll tell you right now that O2 heater circuits are not active when you first turn the key on. Um, if they were, that would affect the computer's monitor of that, and it would be wasted energy. It shouldn't be. We wouldn't want to turn the O2s on with the key on, okay? All right. Uh, so this is a ground side switched circuit that we just have the key on. Would you agree the circuit should be off? Yeah. 
Yeah. Now we need to know a little bit about power ground side circuitry, right? Okay, we don't really need the hypotheticals anymore, do we? We have two actual readings. And what we have is 12 and 0. Is, is there any way that... Now, here's the, the only downside of where we are is I don't know which black wire I'm on because I'm on the sensor side. If I was on the harness side, I, I'd have specific colors, and we know that red and white or red and something was power, so we, we could use that to our advantage. We don't have to. Is there any way that this side could be 12 and this side would be zero? It's really not logical. So is it safe to say that our one black wire is that and our other black wire is that and that the black wire that's reading zero, it's actually 0.3, but close enough to zero, is the control wire? Yes. Okay. And so what we have is key on engine off. What we said is this circuit should be should be what? On or off? The key is on, but the circuit should be off. We shouldn't be turning this O2 heater on yet until we start the car. right? And we saw that on the scan tool, on the duty cycle percentage, that this circuit was 0% until we started the car, and then it went to 100. And then at one point in time, we were down around 4%. But the circuit should be off. Um, so what should, the question to you guys is what is normal off circuit voltage? And I'm, I'm going to draw the switch like this for you to help you. It's not a switch. It's a transistor. What is normal circuit off voltage on a ground side switch circuit? Very good. So now we plug in our section three theory here. 12 and 12 is what we should have. We have 12 and zero. Let's list our options. I like this. This is fun. Are you having fun? You should be because this is what we just covered, and now we have an actual car with this issue. This is pretty cool. Let's list our options for 12 and 0. This is a problem. We all agree? Could it be my T-pin isn't connected properly and I'm not making contact? Absolutely. Uh, did I check that three or four times to make sure I was making contact? Yeah, you guys didn't see that, but I did. This is something you need to do. Okay, T-pin's making contact. All right, let's list our options. An open where? Uh, that's actually, um, sorry, it does look like a, du a digital signal, doesn't it? Um, that's a, a generic picture of a heater circuit. That's actually not the signal. Uh, that's, that's the actual symbol of an O2 heater on a diagram. Yeah, well, that's Mitchell's symbol. Yeah, they'll draw an O2 like this, uh, Dave. It, it'll be, you'll see this, and then you'll see this in the same shell, in the same housing. This is the heater circuit. That's the signal circuit. On our diagram, it didn't show us either one. So I'm just going from past wiring diagrams. That is, this is a heater, okay? Uh all right, so an open in the heater. I agree, an open in the heater would be one. Give me some more. Transistor is off would be 12, right? Normal off circuit voltage would be 12. Transistor is stuck on. Right. Remember, I know the commands, right? That's where you got to remember. The commands are different than what it actually is. That's what the computer wants. That doesn't mean that's what the driver's doing. The driver could be shorted out, pulling this to ground all the time. You, you, ha you don't like that idea? If this driver's blown closed and it's constantly on. Okay? okay? So we said shorted what? Okay, keep going. Short to ground where? Short to ground where? Yeah, and this control wire, right? Uh, anything else? Uh, inside the sensor itself? Yeah, that would just be the sensor. You know, I don't think you would separate an open heater to a shorted to ground heater inside. Do you know what I mean? No, that's not going to happen anyway. I think that's pretty much it. Why is it not these two? Because it's not. 
No, the circuit's off right now. And I'm telling you, it's not a shorted driver or a short to ground in the control wire because there's another test we did that we're not plugging in here right now. The amp test. The amp test showed us what kind of amperage. None. A short to ground would cause what kind of amperage? Constant. A short to ground, shorted driver would cause what kind of amperage? Constant. Does that make sense? See where we're plugging in all of our stuff now? Uh, this is an open O2 heater. We really don't need to go any further. We are done. However, just to make ourselves feel better, and I don't know if I had this in Section 3 or not, but I do this a lot, and you could develop this from there. Can I verify that the driver functions? Can I verify my control circuit integrity? I can if I take this T-pin that I'm already attached to and make this my test light to battery positive and then start the car, my test light should light because the driver should turn on and it should... Yeah, now there's driver shutdown. Remember that conversation? If this test doesn't work, we may have to clear the codes and then redo it. And I want to see this freaking test light light. Is that, that would address also my T-pin, wouldn't it? If, if my T-pin wasn't making contact and my reading I have is complete BS, this is also going to address that. If this test doesn't work, I might want to readjust my T-pin and make sure I'm getting the right reading. I did, but I wanted to do this. Is it necessary here? Where we are, it's not, but it's kind of cool to make you feel, if this is your car and it's a $300 sensor, uh -huh. would this make you $300 confident? We're, we kind of already are. We have an open in the heater, no question about it. Um, but doing this test would be pretty cool. Um, so if you guys want to come over here and I'll show you that, let's work smart, not hard, right? Am I already connected to that control wire with my jumper wire and my rigged up setup right here? Is this already connected? Yeah. So can't I just put my test light right there? Wouldn't that be the same thing? Yeah. Um, so what I want to do, it's ground side switched. What I want to do, wow, that is a major corroded battery terminal. Um, what I want to do is connect to battery positive, touch my test light, make sure it lights when I get a ground. And then I'm going to connect it right here. And we can look at voltage at the same time if you want to, although not necessary, right? We can just, I'll, I'll try to get both in here. We'll kind of clip that in there and I didn't expect the light to be lit right now but I do expect to see 12 volts on my voltmeter you were moving ahead. Yeah. And, and we do see that here I'll get you a shot of that this voltage that's on here right now is actually coming through my test light right mm -hmm. so that would be that 11.8 volts is is the test light looking for a ground now yeah. right mm -hmm. okay so um, go to our scan data because we want to look at the command we see the command. Um, see, that might not be an accurate data pad right now. The car is not running. This 0%. Oh, no, that's right. 0% would be off. Circuit's off. Yeah. When the computer turns this sensor on, I want to see that light light. And based on duty cycle percentage, that light is going to be bright or dim. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we'll catch the initial. I don't know. There's no way I'm going to show both of these at the same time, or can I? I might be able to. Um, it would be really nice if I could. And I think that's good. We're at zero percent. Um, focus here. This is the command. This is going to be the output, this light. Um, Jamie, can you start the car for me? And here's hoping it works. Otherwise, I look foolish. It should work. We may have to clear the codes. Go ahead. Okay, question here, it's not working, but the question here is, is a 4% duty cycle enough current? Come up here, Jamie. Is a 4% duty cycle enough current to light that bulb of that test light? I, I don't know. So what I can use though is my voltage waveform. I'm still connected to my scope that I should have a pulse here I don't. All right, so it's not controlling that right now, even though that command said 4%. So what I want to do now is I believe this to be drivers. Nothing, I don't think. It went. Yeah, it went Did it? Yeah, it went. I missed it? Yeah. I was looking away. Yeah, I can go back.
That right there? Yeah. I wanna see I wanna see that again. Alright, but and let me let me just finish my thought here. I, I believe this to be driver shutdown, meaning the computer has a code for this sensor and it's turning it off. I know there's a command there. This seems a little bit contradictory. Uh, I believe if I clear this fault, I can make this thing do what I want it to do. Let me go back to the scanner. See, there's a hundred now. Let me go back to the scope. That should not be doing that. So now my concern is my T-pin. If my T-pin's never making contact with this signal wire, then everything that we just did, our 0.3 of a volt was wrong, our zero volt was wrong, and the reason I'm not seeing it now is I'm not actually connected to this circuit. The fact that I'm seeing, the fact that I am seeing 100% duty cycle command and not seeing a pulse on a ground side switch circuit makes me think exactly that, that my T-pin is not connected. I, I need to reposition my T-pin. Um, actually, we could leave the car run. So what I'm going to do to make this determination is first of all, I'm going to take my test light out of the picture. I mean, unless I'm not, oh, oh my God. damn it. <laughs> do you guys see what, I was good. It wasn't my T-pin that was the issue, but it was my connection at my, at my rigged up setup. So that's okay. We didn't miss our window of opportunity, did we? So, um, let me, let me reposition this to make sure we're having, uh, good contacts here okay. and uh, yeah that's what we wanted to see isn't it all right and n notice the the on time see how long the on time is here yeah. let me let me uh, set a trigger here that will make that not so jumpy it'll kind of stabilize it for us and I'll teach you guys how to do this stuff later trigger okay. setups and you see how I made that signal a lot more useful yeah um, that off time is the small area, our on time is the low area, okay. and uh, basically, but how's our computer, guys? Good. How is our, our computer is fine. If I take my test light out of this equation, um, what you'll see is there's our zero volt signal yeah. again. That shouldn't be there. That's zero volts because the heater is open. We already knew that, okay? Mm -hmm. The test light just said, hey, our control circuit integrity is good. Our driver's good. No question about it. O2 heater. And I know it might be a little bit of overkill for some people, but in a situation like this, is it possible that the that the heater circuit went bad in that it over too much current flow first and cooked the driver? And then you know, is this something we want to check? And that was the emphasis I made. Do you do you guys notice that we didn't follow any kind of manufacturer flow chart? Yeah. All we did was, look, I've never worked on one of these cars either. That should hopefully excite you a little bit mm -hmm. because this is the same stuff. It's a ground side switch circuit. I used a diagram. I did some voltage measurements. So I confirmed integrity. A lot of people are going to say, man, you're going to cook that driver with that test light. My response to you with that is that test light draws 200 milliamps. And the heater circuit on this car is at least, at least one amp of current, at least. Now, this being an air fuel ratio sensor, they're even higher. So how much is my, is my light drawing? 200 milliamps. Am I stressing that computer driver w no. with my test light right now? No. Not at all. Not even close. How confident are we in our control circuit and our driver? How Fair. confident are we that we need an O2 heater? Fair. Sorry, we need an O2 sensor, don't we? Any questions? That's exactly what we're doing here is we, we are bypassing... Uh, well, it's not a bypass test in that we're telling the computer to do something and signaling the computer, but we're using the test light as the, it, we're bypassing the, the heater itself and we're using the test light as our guide here to, to that the control circuit's good. So no, I would not call this a bypass test. I would call this a, uh, um, a driver test. A control circuit and driver test is what this is. Do you guys remember the scenario I gave you? You get a solenoid in and it's melted and you want to check the driver and the control wire and make sure your integrity is good? You're looking at it. This would be it. Or if you have a sensor that's open, which we know, and we use the rest of this just to say that we were right about that open, right? Like we went down a path and we found an open in the O2 heater. And so we backed up and said, hey, we have another test we can use that we can check the control wire and driver. And that will also make us feel more comfortable that we indeed had an open. And that's what you're looking at right here, too. Two different paths that put us to the same conclusion.
Why were we not seeing that signal before? The computer was commanding it, but there was no voltage for it to drop. It was zero all the time. If you ground side switch a circuit that has no voltage on it, what are you going to see? Nothing. We have to give it a supply. Well, you wouldn't want to go to battery voltage, not unless you want to cook the computer. We need a resistor in there. That's our test light. What's that? A good one will show us something similar, yes. Now the thing is, these commands will be different probably because this O2 signal, I'll tell you right now, is poor because the O2 is not heating up like it should be. And so what the computer's issuing right now it looks to me is full commands for heat. And I believe a good sensor, we wouldn't see this long of a pulse width for this long of a period of time because it would be hot, the sensor would be reacting, and it would throttle it back. Okay guys, this is part two of this Nissan with the O2 heater circuit. We replaced the O2. I just wanna get you guys focused on the scan tool. I have the amp probe already connected. You see that black cable here running in the back. Kinda of tough to see the, the red amp probe sticking out back there. There you go. Um, so I'm already connected as before. Now we have not started this car yet. It is completely cold. It has not run since yesterday. Uh, I set the scope up a little bit different. This time what we're looking at is this is scan data over here and I have the scope screen on the scan tool screen. I've shown you guys how to do this in other videos. I'm not doing that now. Our primary focus is just getting you guys an amperage number for this heater circuit and then just really showing you the controls from startup. So go ahead and start the car. And I buried my scale there. So the only downside of this, my initial amperage, is we went over five amps of current flow, initial current. And there is your pulsed signal, and you see a whole lot different command over here to the left than what we had before because we had a dead O2, it wasn't reacting at all. The computer is, is definitely, the computer's definitely controlling this differently than it was with the open O2 heater circuit. So we were looking really at 100% at times and then four or 5%. Would be nice to um, get that initial turn on one more time. I wanna do this one more time. Looks like with an initial amperage of 4.2. Does that say 4.2 to the right, right there? Yeah, 4.2 amps was my initial. I'm pretty sure it was higher than that before. Not 100% positive. That's pretty cool. I'll lower the time base, let you see a little bit more detail here. I'm actually on my graphing multimeter. And, and the reason I needed to be on that instead of the scope was to have this extra window in here that we were able to look at, we are able to look at both the pulse width signal live current and scan data. You have to go through the component test meter and I chose the O2 heater and just happened to be the graphing meter. Uh, I don't really wanna get into that right now. We can see the on time command is around 30, 35%. The on time is the low portion in this signal in fact, I could probably make that just a little more user or viewer friendly by setting a trigger. I guess I cannot set a trigger in the graphing multimeter, so that sucks, but is what it is. I could have chosen a different component for the scope to show up. I'm not going to worry about that. You can see the low portion of this signal this low portion would be my on time, the upper portion, oh, I'm sorry. We're looking at current, not voltage. So I am speaking incorrectly here. I was going to tell you that the low portion of, I was going to tell you the low portion of this signal is the on time and the upper portion is the off time. That's completely false. We're looking at current flow now, not voltage. And when we have current flow is our on time, and when we don't have current flow is our off time. So it's the opposite of the voltage. Um, and that makes sense that the command is around 30 and that the on time, the upper portion would be less than the lower portion, the off time. So I apologize for that. 
we are looking at current this time. We could not see that pattern before because our heater circuit was open. We did see that on a voltage waveform, but we only saw the control when we had our test light in there simulating the O2. And again, this one's current and our min-max voltage here. Sorry, I keep saying voltage. Our min-max current, we're going from zero to around two and a half amps of current flow. So again, for any of you that think that I hurt this driver by using my test light that draws 200 milliamps are, are very much mistaken. Trust me, that test light is way less current than what this good working heater circuit is at. Final test. I promise this is the last one. I had one of my students ask me, hey, can we, can we ohm check this heater circuit? And the answer is yes, we can. Now, it's not necessary. We know based on the results of everything that we've done already that we had an open heater. And even if I measure this and I read some resistance, it's irrelevant, but it can be done. And um, it's really just the two black wires. And my meter is set on a mega ohm scale. It's on an auto range, actually. So the two black wires would be these top two tabs. This is a little bit difficult to do and actually be able to show you what I'm doing, but I have a alligator clip on the one tab and being careful not to touch the alligator clip with my other meter lead. Uh, hopefully that's showing up on the camera. I am touching the heater circuit and we have exactly what we thought, which is an open in the heater circuit. So it's just another check that you guys can do. Uh, it's another confirmation type test and uh, just wanted to show that final thing because I get a lot of questions on resistance and things like that. I guess the reason I don't like resistance testing is, you know, this is room temperature and, you know, resistance can change. Heater circuits can open up. My, my preference with, with opens is, is doing voltage tests. We can identify it just as easily. So to each his own.